Welcome back to another episode of What Are You Made Of with your boy Mike C-Rock. Let me get my mic straight here. Guys, thank you so much for joining us again. Much gratitude to you, the audience, you supporters of What Are You Made Of movement and the Rocket Fuel book. Guys, today I have my friend Devin Harris. I, I, I'm very fortunate to have met some of the most wonderful people over the last year. And Devin fits right in with the, 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 the quality of people that I've been meeting. And so uh, I, I want to introduce you to Devin, though he's the... the basically a former bobsledder. I don't know if you bobsled anymore, but since his days on the bobsled mm -hmm. slopes, Devin Harris has become a top corporate keynote speaker and author sharing his philosophy of keep on pushing and never stop dreaming with Fortune 100 companies across many industries. In addition to his work as a top Olympic motivational speaker, he is also the founder and CEO of the Keep On Pushing Foundation, a New York-based 501c3 charity mm -hmm. focused on helping children in disadvantaged communities receive a quality education. He has devoted his time to visiting the troops in the Persian Gulf and around the United States and more recently assumed responsibility for developing the next generation of Jamaican bobsledders. <laughs> Let's go, Davin. Welcome to the What Are You Made Of show. Hey, Mike. Thank you so much for having me, man. How are you doing, bro? I'm doing great, man. I'm just trying to, you know, going through this week, actually trying to simplify some things. I think that yeah. like we start simple and then we start adding things. And before you know it, there's some chaos and confusion. So it's good to take a step back and get rid of some things and reprioritize. Always, always, absolutely. And that's mm -hmm. what this week's been for me. But uh, this isn't about me. This is about you. So I want to start off the show by asking you the same question that we ask all of our guests. Devin, what are you made of? <sighs> what am I made of? Um, it's a really good question, man. I, you know, I, I just, I describe myself as the most determined person I know. So I think I'm just made of tenacity, determination, persistence, perseverance. I, I'm just the guy, kind of guy that's unwilling to do without that which he wants. <laughs> I love it. You know, you know, I, I talk about stubborn a lot and perversely unyielding. That sounds like well, it to me. Yes, I remember that. Perversely yeah. unyielding. Dude, you're worse than I am, I think. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, unyielding is powerful enough, right? But then you got to mm -hmm. go perversely in it. So, yeah. so take us back, man. I want to hear what you're made of. What's your story, man? What, like, you can take us back to when you were like in, crawling or or as late after that as you want but take us back yeah. so you know I, I i can go all the way back to when uh, you know uh, i live with my grandmother so you mentioned a jamaican bobsled team and they're probably hearing from the accent that i'm jamaican too cool accent right yeah, a little like bit, little bit. <laughs> um so I, I spent my early years with my grandmother mike and she, the thing i remember about her was she was this amazing storyteller and the stories that are that i believe impacted me the most were the ones she told me about soldiers and the, how crazy these guys were. They could, uh, you know, perform these amazing feat and not get hurt. And it just kind of lit up my five-year-old imagination. I wanted to become a soldier because of that. But more importantly, those stories inspired me to want to try uh, pursue goals that everybody has thought was difficult or impossible. And that has just kind of stayed with me, man. And um, and you know, I don't know if. You know, it's a kind of chicken or the egg kind of thing. Was it a story? Were the stories that inspired me to just be just the un perversely unyielding guy like you? Or did I have that in my DNA and the stories kind of lit that fire, you know? Um, don't know. So I, I, so I, I eventually left and I went to Kingston to live with my, my dad. I grew up in a place called Olympic Gardens. It's a really tough ghetto environment, you know, impoverished and violent. Um, and you're always looking, and, and not far from where I lived, you know, you could see all these beautiful houses on the hill. And, and so there's such a stark contrast between my reality and what's out there. And there was just a part of me that wanted some of that too. Um, and I kind of grew up with, 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 with guys who um, were just kind of settled, settled, happy to settle for what we had in our environment. And I remember them calling themselves sufferers. And at 13 years old, man, one, I remember it so well. In the summer, I just said, hey, we're not friends anymore. I just started walking a different, yeah, I just started to do it. It, it was not pleasant. You know, we're, we live in the, the age of political correctness now, but I had to bust a couple of heads just to, Get them to understand that uh, no, I am not doing what you're doing, you know. Well, and, I know, and, and let me stop you for a second, hmm. just because I got to tell you something. I was just in a clubhouse room. We were talking about this same topic, 
And you know, you hear per, like growing up, I've heard this before. Like they would talk about churches sometimes, or they would talk about groups and they would say, man, they, they just cut people off. They don't want anything to do with some people. Mm-hmm. And then everybody mm-hmm. that was complaining about that was, were people that were the sufferers, the settlers, yeah. the people that were, and they're the only ones that complain about that. The successful yeah. and high accomplishing people never complain about other people cutting people off that are holding them back. And that we were just talking about that. And that's why I was smiling. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but I had to say <laughs> no, that. No, I mean, it's, no, it's, it's, and it, and yeah. And, and it's not that youth. Cause I, I, at no time felt I was better than them. They were just burdensome, man. The, the thought of, embracing that kind of mindset and thinking meant that I was going to be stuck in this misery, looking up on those people who are living so well, right? And succeeding. And, and yeah, so I just kind of cut them off. Um, lived a very different life. I was talking about this recently about just, you know, in my neighborhood, I'm the only guy who's going for runs, right? That I, cause I, I, I was running track and I was, you know, I really wanted to do well at the, the junior level and had my eyes set on the Olympics. And so I'm, I'm, I'm like the only guy who's doing what I do. Like at 19, we have a very different uh, school system in Jamaica. At 19 years old, I'm the only guy at my age in school still, you know, just walking a very different path. And like, right, so right after high school, I joined the army. Um, I did my training in England at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, which is like West Point. Uh, but but for the British Army, and came back to Jamaica and served as an officer again. The only ghetto kid, <laughs> um, you know. And and then if you fast forward to, it's 1987. I'm like, yeah, the Olympics, man. I really want to go to the Olympics. They're coming up in a year in Seoul, Korea. And I'm not. I wasn't dreaming about being no Jamaican bobsledder. I wanted to go run. Um, but so did the, you did you run track and field in school? I ran track. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, but, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm Jamaican, but I was no sprinter. Well, not a very fast one in a way, by Jamaican standards. <laughs> you know, you, you, you have to deal with the, 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 the cars that life deal you, man. So yeah. I wanted to win something. I'm like, screw this. I'm not running any 100 meters. 800 meters it is. You know, so I ran 800 and 1500 and I won. So I'm like, all right, cool. I found my, my calling. Um, but... So it's eight to seven, and I'm thinking I can get fit enough to go to the Olympics to run 800 and 1500. And the Bob said idea was born by two Americans, and they couldn't find sprinters to do it. So they came to the army looking for athletes. My colonel suggested that I try it out for the team. And I'm now, you know how it is, man. Sometimes an opportunity just kind of fall in your lap. And it's like, are you going to go, man? I don't want to have anything to do with that. It's so far out of left field, or you're going to go, wow, I, I better grab this with both hands. So I grabbed it with both hands. And so here we are talking. You said, you said yes. I said yes, man. I said, you have to say yes to opportunity, man. You know, people, you know, when, when people hear the word opportunity, Mike, I think, th- this is what I think in my head, I, I picture, that they think it's a, it's kind of like a big box wrapped in colorful wrapping with a bow. And they just un- unfold the bow, untie the bow and take the wrapping off and voila, opportunity, enjoy. No, opportunity is just, hey, an, a, a chance to go to work, dude, working on them skills, um, you know, getting the knowledge so you can take advantage of the real opportunity that's there. You can go into that person that can become this thing that you want to become. And so that you were on the first, the first team, right? Yeah, yeah, I was on the, the, one of the first guys. And where did they go to practice? So um, our first, <laughs> it's kind of a crazy story. Our first, the first time we saw a bobsled track, a bobsled um, was in Lake Placid, New York in September 87. So uh, note that September 1987, the Olympics are in February 88. The first time we're seeing a track and a bobsled is it's September 87, right? Wow. <laughs> and so then we spent like that month about, uh, um, yeah, that first month, September to mid-October in Jamaica, pushing this makeshift sled on, on, on wheels on a concrete surface on the armor base in Kingston. And then we went to Calgary and went on a bobsled track for the first time. Spent maybe six weeks there, 
just trying not to kill ourselves, quite frankly. Um, and then we went to Innsbruck, Austria, and we did one race against the B teams from some of the major nations, um, went home for Christmas, then went back to Lake Placid, New York, uh, uh, spent a month there, again, trying not to kill ourselves. And then we went to the Olympic Games. What was going through your mind during all that? Like, well, I, I, the thought process? Yeah, well, well my first time um, on ice, and, and on ice, I, by that I mean that weekend when we went to Lake Placid and saw a bobsled for the first time, um, the Americans were there practicing their starts on, the, on an ice rink. And they invited us. And dude, it was one of the most difficult things. I couldn't walk on the ice. Like we spent more time on our on our butts. And I'm thinking, man, this Bob said thing is harder than I thought. I thought I was just gonna just, you know, but it I, you know, years ago a guy asked, uh, I was giving a talk, you know, at what point did we believe we couldn't do it? And I'm saying, Well, that, I've never been asked that before. Never. We, it, it, like the thought of us not making it and not doing it just never factored in. It was like, okay, so this is a little bit difficult. Let's keep working. Let's keep trying. And um, it's an important lesson, I think, for, for all of us. You know, most of what we need, Mike, to succeed is skill-based. Writing, reading, speaking, you, you know, all of those things, right? Selling, um, marketing, you know? They're skills, man, and you can learn them. You practice them. You develop them. Initially, you, you know, when you start, you're awful at it. But if you just, you know, I was speaking this morning about having a growth mindset, just this belief that regardless of the circumstances, you can always uh, become more skilled, become more knowledgeable. Yeah, you're and, so and it's not. There's no shiny bells and whistles. It's about doing the same old boring thing over and over and over again. Right. I mean, so when you see, uh, I'd choose a sport, <laughs> track athlete, uh, football player, basketball player, baseball, they're doing the same thing. They're the baseball guy is swinging the bat, swinging the bat. The basketball players putting up shots. We're doing the same thing over and over. And, and then you go, wow, he's amazing or she's amazing. They have done that movement a million times. So it just seems effortless. It ain't effortless. And, Tons and, of work. And, and so uh, that, the movie Cool Runnings was about you guys? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so so, I, tell, I tell people I'm the handsome one and they take one look at me and laugh. They're like, there's nothing handsome about you. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man, I think you're handsome, man. You, you got it, you got it. You're kind, uh, man, you're so, kind. <laughs> so the story with that, when they made the movie, did they come to you guys and, and did you get anything out of it or did they interview you or how did that process go yeah so um one of the americans who came up with the idea to start the team george fitch um he after calgary he started shopping the story around and you know went through several iterations we met with the writers they took copious notes um and um five years later finally they filmed obviously uh, they took a lot of poetic licensing that's you know, made up stuff to make it funny, stretched the truth to make it funny. Um, and we thought we we're going to be rich. <laughs> but uh, to quote, uh, her name is Dawn Steele. Uh, she was the executive uh, uh, producer for that movie. And uh, she passed away a number of years, unfortunately. But she has a, a book in which she says, in Hollywood, there are no profits. So we, we learned, we learned. Yeah. Uh, it's a very expensive lesson, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know what? It's the intrinsic value of it. You know, it's what mm -hmm. you do with it afterwards. Like how many members of the team were there, by the way? Um, so we had six athletes in Calgary. Four of them ended up on the sled. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. of the six people though, who, who did something with it? Like, that's the question they have to ask yourself. You got this presentation first Jamaican bobsled team. They make a movie about you Is that where you stop or who's going to take this and see what they can get out of it and, and, and basically ring it out. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting that you asked that because years ago I was um, in Jamaica I was speaking and, you know, I had my books there and I remember a girl saying it's, it's amazing. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing her a little bit, but um, it's amazing what the opportunity has done for you, the bobsled opportunity. And I go, no, I made something of it. Because as we were saying earlier, opportunities are time to kind of go, go to work. 
And so, yeah, I, um, I think Chris and Dolly Soaks have done some speaking, you know, in a very limited way, but I'm the only guy who has taken it to this level. Yeah, now, now let's go, but you know, my philosophy uh, about rocket fuel and turning setbacks into rocket fuel and, and all that. Can you take us back to something that still to this day you drive off of and feed off of that, that gives you that fuel, like, no matter what you think of that thing or that person, and you're like, ah, I'm good, I got this. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, I was talking yesterday about relating the story. It's a, it's one of the things, one of the earliest things that got me started, man. So, you know, I grew up poor and um, I, was in, I was in woodwork class and a three-period class at the end of the day in the eighth grade. And this dude embarrassed me. And Mike, I, I did not cry. I bawled. <laughs> It's like I put my head down on the desk and, and the, the teacher did not even try to stop me, man. Um, so this dude was, was a really good athlete, just joined the track team, could probably run backwards blindfolded and beat everybody. So it was just, it was full of himself, you know? And I'm like, you know what? So normally would leave school. I, as soon as the bell rang, I didn't wait to be dismissed. I left the classroom. I would normally walk together. I walked by myself and I said, you know, I'm going to train. I'm going to join the track, track team. I'm going to beat all of them. I did just that. Um, and it's that um, kind of, it's not even the physical training per se, but the mindset that was required to do the training that I think became, formed the foundation that really allowed me to embrace the suck, do the training I needed to, tr to do to eventually get to the Olympic games. So, so yeah, yeah that, that really like, do you I, still, I remember. Do you, do, you sorry, need, do, do you still need fuel today? Like, do you still find yourself searching for fuel deposits somewhere that I need to push a little harder? Like what, what do you deal with today that, that you need fuel for? Um, you know, my, I think my speak, just the speaking business because it's such a, and learning how to, to, to kind of still, I'm still quite frankly learning how to transition from say the sports world to the business world only because, you know, what, as an athlete, I, I know I need to get up and I just need to go to the gym or I need to go for a run. I need whatever it is I need to do and I can gauge my performance and so on. In business, yeah, you know, you need to make some phone calls, et cetera, et cetera, but you're, you're depending on the other person, the person on the other end of the line to uh, live up to that commitment or agreement, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times they don't. And, and so I'm, I'm learning not to pull my hair out. Yeah, see, I've, I've lost yeah. a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning not to pull my hair out, but, not, but learn how to get better. So that's always yeah. the thing. Like, and so I think, I always think back to, I always, kind of get that feeling again, like when I'm standing at the bobsled start, that energy and that focus and that commitment and that fire. And then I just try to bring it to the business world too. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. So when you're working with, you're coaching with someone or speaking, what are two or three points that you really hit on every time that you speak or work with someone? Um, it, dude, you have to start with a dream, start with a vision, you know, have a goal. You need a direction, man. You know, you, you, you need a you need a direction. Yeah, you, you need to have in your mind a, a a destination point, something that you're striving for. And then, where the hell do you want to get there anyway? Um, because if those reasons, you have to connect with those reasons, really intensify them. Because, you know, it's kind of challenging to get from where you are to where you'd like to be. And if you don't have a strong enough reason you're gonna screw it i'm done i'm you know i'm all, let me go let me go over here instead right kind of like uh people that we grew up with you know you're standing in where i grew up olympic guys you're looking up looking up on forest hills and it's a half a world away and it just seems so difficult you know what eh, i stay here no um my reasons were just too strong and then if you have a clear vision and destination in mind and you have the reason I think that fuels your persistence, that fuels your ability to keep on pushing, you know, my thing, you know, you have to, you have to be persistent, man. You can't, 
and I know you can dig this too. You just can't give up, right? They just have yeah. to. Yeah. This is. I I don't I don't know how to give up, and I just don't know how to give up. Yeah, and so, and so that purpose of uh, you have your vision and your purpose, and then that gives you the filter or the the guidance of what your thoughts and your words and your actions are either going towards that or it's going away from it, right? Simplifying mm-hmm. it, right? There's yeah. no, there's no chaos and confusion or or, or, or or all this all this stuff going on. It's pretty much everything that comes down to you just simplify it, right? Is that yeah, yeah. And so when when you you know meet up on some obstacles you uh, you know get frustrated because whatever happens because you know that's that stuff is going to happen you go back to that that image of the vision of the of the destination and the purpose and that then gives you more rocket fuel it tops up your fuel to keep pushing through yeah so take us through that though so in your life and in a past and and going forward when you have a disappointment someone lets you down setback whatever it is and it's not a little one it's a big one and you get that feeling right here, right? Some people experience it in their head. I get it right here. It's like, oh man, that feeling, I don't yeah. like it. It's the worst. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I will do whatever I got to do, take action immediately to get rid of that feeling. But take us through the process for you when you feel that feeling and you recognize and acknowledge like, oh boy, something ain't right. Like, what do you do to get back right back on track? Yeah, this is our family show, right? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You can, you can, no, no, no. No, no, it's okay. No, no, it's no, open. No, no. Yeah, you can. Yeah, so no, I'm like, yeah, you know, after I'm done swearing, you know, after, you know, Jamaican curse words. Yeah. Uh, you you just kind of have to retool and refocus, and you. I said earlier, I am unwilling to do without that which I want, and so now it comes back down to okay, um, it's a it's it, success is a part of it is a thinking game, man. So you go okay, this didn't work out. What do I need to do? And you start running through. It's almost like a pilot running through a checklist, a checklist, checklist when they're in, in trouble, right? Bam, bam, bam. You start running through all the checklists and you, you, you mull them over and you go with your best option. Sometimes you don't have great options, but you go with your, and you can't sit around waiting for the perfect time either. You go with your best option. You, I, I do advise people so, that there are times when you should wait as long as you possibly can before you pull the trigger. And by that, I mean, sometimes we're just going through a really, really tough time. And what I've discovered in my life is during those really dark moments, you may think you're thinking clearly, but you're not. And you don't want to make a decision that has long um, consequences while you're under maximum stress. So your job, what I do is that I keep thinking about what my options are. And, you know, a lot of times I come back to option B. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. And I keep thinking about it and I, and I, and I keep, I try to delay taking action and action B for as long as I can. Yeah. Cause I want to be sure or as sure as you can. And you know what? Sometimes after, you know, you have some of that emotional turmoil has evaporated. You realize that C was a better option. And you go, whew, I'm so glad I didn't take action and B. Or other times B is the one. You pull the trigger and you go, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I think I love that. And that is why I talk about proactively preparing yourself for setbacks. Mm -hmm. You can eliminate the emotion out of it then you don't have that, that, that delay. So yeah. I believe that as well, because you can never trust your emotions. You can never trust to make decisions when emotions are high. So what, if, what could you do and how powerful would it be if you could proactively prepare yourself so that when something does happen, you already know, let's not get emotional about this. Yeah. Know this is for, for, my, for my good. This is a training session or fuel. Which is it? Right. And then the emotions out of it. And so I agree hundred percent with you. And that's why I talk about the proactive effect of preparing yourself. So I absolutely love that. So Devin, what's next for you? What are you, what are your plans for 2021 and beyond? Like, what are you getting into? Yeah. Well, you know what, you know, so 2020 it was a crazy year uh, for all of us, a, a, a curse and a blessing. I think that the, the fact that we had a pandemic really caused me to, well, cause all of us to slow down a bit. And as, 
for me, it caused me to really evaluate or reevaluate my business. And that has taken me on, um, you know, just uh, as opposed to, you know, flying around the world, jumping on stages, looking at creating online programs and reaching out. So now I'm working with, co you know, companies with, with my mindset resilience uh, training, um, especially for their sales team. That's just that's the, one of the things that I've discovered is there's such a, uh, a similarity between salespeople and athletes and soldiers, right? I've been an athlete, I've been a soldier. We're all trained, but we don't always execute, right? Salespeople, the same thing. They know what to do, but they don't execute, right? They fall in a slump, kind of like an athlete. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've been, uh, you know, really working uh, at, at getting that kind of training out and, and through my podcast as well, keep on pushing. And by the way, thank you for, for uh, coming on, keep on pushing, brother. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. posting that soon. Uh, but yeah, just you know, connecting with amazing uh, people with amazing stories of inspiration and putting it out there is about putting out as much good as I possibly can in the world. I love that's it. that's the goal. I love it, man. Well, look, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. Um, you, you've been an awesome, awesome person that every time I've connected with you, you just, you know, you fill me with energy, man. And I, I love it. I love you. I appreciate you. And I want to thank you. And last question before I, before I get into that last question, how can my audience engage with you further or follow you or where do they go? Yeah, man. So my, my website is easy. DevonHarris.com. Thought I'd make it easy. Um, on social media, I, Instagram and Twitter, Keep on pushing 88 is where I am. Keep on pushing 88. Uh, my YouTube channel is uh, youtube.com slash keep on pushing always. So join me over there. And on Facebook, I'm the guy in the Jamaica bobsled uniform. Can't miss it. I love it. I love it. All right, Devin, here's the final question. Now, yeah. you know my rocket fuel concept. What does that rocket fuel law mean to you in your life and what it's meant? You get, got into it a little bit, but I'd just like to hear one or two sentences of what. Yeah, well, you know, I see so much similarities between rocket fuel and this idea of keep on pushing, man. It's, it's really about, so rockets are overcoming the inertia to leave Earth, right? And that's what we're doing at the Bob Said Start as well, overcoming the inertia. But it's not one massive action. It's a, it's a process um, as you go from zero to wherever, right? And everything we do in our lives, we have to co overcome that initial inertia and then keep growing, keep pushing, keep striving, soaring to higher heights. And so the rocket fuel uh, does that. I love it, man. Thrust is a must, right? Thrust Ooh, is a must. <laughs> I'm going to have to board that one, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like it because, it, hey, it's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Is that a sexual thing or what? <laughs> I get attention. So that's why I, I love that saying, thrust is a must, yeah. baby. So, all right, Devin, well, thank you so much for being here, guys. You've been listening to the What Are You Made Of podcast with your boy C-Rock and our guest, Devin Harris. Go show him some love. And guys, keep on coming back. Go get that Rocket Fuel book at MikeCRock.com forward slash book. It is coming out March uh, we are, I'm so fired up. Grant Cardone wrote the forward for it and we're going to get it out there to you and change the world. I have a lot of other things in the works that I am so excited to bring to you. So just keep staying tuned, keep engaged with me. And until next time, be unstoppable.